Everyone wants to have a podcast. Everyone almost needs to have a podcast. You should only do a podcast if it's going to... Nick Molster, founder of Fountain, a visionary podcast platform that empowers your fans to grow your podcast. Nick shares his tips on effective podcast strategies and goes deep about his personal journey through addiction. I might come across as very confident and self-assured, but that is not the case. This is something, particularly amongst founders, that people hide and they have to conceal just in their fight to survive. How can you be a leader if you're a passenger in your own life? Coming from Nike and starting Fountain, going from being one of 77,000 employees to just being me and my co-founder was definitely a big change. On Fountain, you can share short clips. You can follow other users to start seeing their clips. You can send a boost, which is just a comment with a payment attached to it. Social interactions in the app drive discovery for other listeners, but they also drive growth for podcasts. What do you think is the future of podcasting? Hello, my fellow leaders. Welcome back to Anatomy of a Leader with me, Maria Vorostovsky. If you're a regular here, there's a very easy way to show your support and to help us grow. Download the Fountain app on your mobile, follow Anatomy of a Leader with Maria Vorostovsky, and just start listening. You can share your thoughts on this episode by sending a boost. It's like a payment with a message. And see what other listeners have to say or create clips that you could share with others. Getting started is super easy and you can top up your Fountain wallet with your bank card. Oh, and you can also earn rewards by listening to the Fountain app too. It's seriously a no brainer. Follow the link in the show notes or visit fountain.fm to find out more. Nick, welcome to Anatomy of a Leader. Thanks for having me, Maria. Nice to meet you and thanks for, for reaching out and really bringing my attention to your podcast platform, Fountain. Uh, so we'd love to talk about that and you know, understand more about why you started it, where the idea came from and how it came to be. Yeah, so um, I started Fountain uh, two and a half years ago. I'd always been really into podcasts, particularly in lockdown. You know, that was basically the one thing that got me through lockdown was listening to podcasts. And um, at the time I was working uh, at Nike, I was working in brand marketing. I always knew that I wanted to do my own thing and didn't really necessarily know what that thing was gonna be or who it would be with. Uh, And then my school friend, Oscar, we were just playing around, talking about some ideas. And it really was a case of right place, right time. We started working on something together. It wasn't a podcast app. It was more like a social audio app where you can record short clips and share them with friends. And we were playing around with that. It didn't really work because the issue is you have to get people to create content for you. And that's really difficult as a small uh, company. So we decided to make a podcast app and it was right place, right time, because at the same time, this really exciting movement called podcasting 2.0 was just evolving. And the idea was basically to uh, build new features onto the RSS feed, which is the technology that distributes podcasts to all the different podcast apps you listen to, uh, you listen on. And yeah, to to introduce new features that bring different levels of interactivity and engagement that you didn't find before. So we launched Fountain and um, we we had some, we had some early traction. The thing that really uh, got us noticed was the fact that we had integrated payments into the app. So as a listener, you can directly support the podcast you're listening to without having to go to sign up on Patreon or go to a PayPal link or go into your web browser and do buy me a coffee. You can just support as you're listening. Um, And the way that you support is actually with Bitcoin because that allows you to make payments instantly, seamlessly, low fee um, and peer to peer. So we had early traction in the Bitcoin community. Um, You know, as a podcast, you can simply claim your podcast on Fountain. We basically then create a wallet for you that allows you to start receiving payments from listeners. And we grew really through podcasters just telling their audiences about Fountain and saying, hey, come and support me. Uh, I think it was really wise that we did integrate with Bitcoin um, because it was a niche. It's something that people are incredibly passionate about in the Bitcoin community. And I think people just found out about this new application of the technology and were really excited to see what it can do. So it all went from there, really. And um, I'd say that the best way to describe Fountain really is it's a podcast app that allows you to discover new podcasts. Um, because really there's so many podcasts out there and so little time it's really difficult to know what you're going to want to listen to next and on fountain you can share short clips so you've got a clipping editor in the podcast player 
So you can share clips. You can follow other users to start seeing their clips. Uh, you can make payments, I mentioned before. So you can send a boost, which is just a comment with a payment attached to it. Anyone who follows you is also going to see your boosts. And you can also create a playlist as well. So all of these interactions, these social interactions in the app drive discovery for other listeners. But they also drive growth for podcasters as well. So it's really a much more interactive and social experience for podcasting. What kind of a feature is the most popular? Do you have stats on that? Uh, well, actually, one of the things that we did. So, yeah, we launched back in, I think, 2021. And later that year, we uh, launched this listen to earn idea. The reason for that is because early adopters of the platform were Bitcoiners. They already had Bitcoins. So they could top up their fountain wallet and start supporting. But for the majority of you know people who don't have Bitcoin, it was really difficult to get started. So we introduced a new system where you can actually earn Bitcoin just by firstly listening to podcasts if you're a regular listener you could earn for every minute you listen and secondly you know the clips you create the comments you post and the, the playlists you build when other users like your you know activity you get paid by them as well so you, users have a way of earning money and that was definitely very popular particularly at the time you know bitcoin was rising in price there was a lot of interest in it so we saw massive growth through that so i'd, I'd say that that still today is probably our most compelling feature for people. Hmm. So in terms of the people who are your kind of early adopters, would you say they kind of have that gaming mentality? Yes, well, there's actually, there's a lot of similarities and overlap, I think, between the Bitcoin audience and the gaming audience. And I'd say also to a lesser extent, a sports audience, because I think that Bitcoin and wider cryptocurrency has just, um, you know, filtered its way into those industries through things like sponsorship for better or for worse, I think, like probably for worse. Um, but yeah, certainly, uh, you know, the gaming mentality, I think it's just really people who are curious about new technologies and also identify with the frustrations that we see with podcast apps that, you know, they're very functional and utilitarian. If you compare, you know, Apple Podcasts or Spotify, say to YouTube, where, you know, YouTube is a, a video streaming platform, but it's also a social network in itself. You know, you have comments, you've got clips, you've got playlists, you've got all the things that Fountain does. And we just think like, why don't we have that in podcasting? And so I think our early adopters are people who are just interested to see the possibilities of what a podcast app could be. Mm -hmm. I, as a podcaster myself, one of the most difficult things is not knowing who the audience is. It's almost like a closed door yeah. where, and I get that even with my friends who listen, they say, oh, I feel like I have a relationship with you because, you know, every day I'm seeing either your post or, you know, listening to something. And I'm like, but it's so one sided. I don't get to see or at least not in the same frequency of, you know, who the listeners are, what they're thinking, what resonates with them. So what of the features that you think really helps podcasters with that aspect? Yeah, I think you're exactly right. I'd, I'd, I'd describe the the relationship between the podcaster and the listener is a long distance relationship, yeah. you know, <laughs> you're, 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 you're there, you're committed, you're listening every week, but you know, there's not that regular contact. And most importantly, there's no feedback. And when you look at the stats, I think something like 90% of new podcasts don't get past episode three. Which it really, is crazy. I thought it was 10. Is this a new stat? No, no, yeah, no, I did, this, this is what I saw uh, right. recently for the industry stats. And so, yeah, 90% of podcasts don't get past episode three. And the reason for that is because there's no feedback. You know, you might have a listener out there or 10 listeners or 100 listeners, but you're not actually being told, I really like this episode or I would like to get more of this or it'd be great if you could speak to this guest. You don't get that feedback. So that's, I think, one of the most important things about Fountain is the ability just to send a boost, like I said, a payment with a comment, and other listeners also can like and reply to those comments as well. And as a podcaster, if you claim your podcast, you see all that activity coming into the app. So it's a great way to um, get insights about what your audience is interested in, how they find your podcast, but it's also a great source of motivation, I think, particularly for early podcasters figuring out their niche uh, to just to get some feedback to to motivate them to just to continue to make the podcast. Yeah, it's very really hard to know what resonates and just to continue creating content in a vacuum. You either have to be, and I'm speaking as a podcaster myself, you either have to be really committed to your vision and it's all like no matter what the feedback is, you just kind of like keep going and 
keep putting yourself out there and you know creating the content that you believe is good or you know trying to find some ways of either kind of collecting emails or doing surveys but those things and I tried like these things are so hard um so yeah having some sort of an interaction is definitely really helpful what advice do you have for podcasters on how to use your platform best particularly with regards to you know engaging with the listeners yeah so the the single most important thing is just to let your listeners know how and why to support you on fountain um and what you see in podcasts is maybe at the start where you talk about you know this episode is with so and so you can find this episode on all platforms you know make sure you like subscribe give us a rating review all of those things that's the moment to mention fountain or at the end as well um and just to ask people for feedback I think it's really important as well to um, get the why right, because ultimately you're asking your listeners to pay for something which is already available for free. And I think that's just kind of accepted as fact now that podcasts are free. It's over to the podcaster to work out how they're going to monetize their content, whether that be through ads, subscriptions, uh, you know, doing live events, courses, whatever it might be. And I think that, you know, you will see a portion of listeners who are such fans of the podcast who would they're willing to go to any lengths to support you so if there was an easy way to send you a payment they would do it but i think the way to appeal to your wider audience base is actually to really appeal to their best interests and really i think your fans want you to succeed as much as you do you know they would do anything to help you grow to bring more listeners in because ultimately it benefits them you know it means that the content's going to keep on coming the guests are going to keep getting better. Maybe you start doing video, maybe you start doing this and that. And the, the whole thing just evolves from there. So, you know, even if people, you know, don't have the money to be able to support the podcast, they can actually show their support by creating a clip or commenting or creating a playlist, sharing links. All of these things that people do can help you drive growth. So I'd say the single most important thing, add that call to action to your podcast. When it comes to building audience engagement what we often see podcasters do is reading out the boost they receive from listeners at the end of the episode this is a great thing to do because it creates a sense of FOMO with other listeners because if I know that I can send you a boost and you're going to read it out or maybe respond to my comment maybe I asked you a question you would answer that other people will be like okay well this is how I get in contact with Maria this is how I can engage with the show and kind of be be a part of it so Reading out the boost is a, another thing uh, that I would always suggest podcasters do. Building your app, what have you learned about podcasts in general? I think the main thing is, speaking first about podcasters themselves, is there's just such a wide variety of different people out there. Their motivations for starting a podcast are very different and also their measures for success are very different. So I think at the lower end of the scale, you've got, you know, obviously in a time where starting a podcast is a very trendy thing to do right everyone wants to have a podcast everyone almost needs to have a podcast and do I you think, think they need to do you think people need to have a podcast now no i don't think you need to have a podcast mm. i think you should only do a podcast if it's going to help serve a, a goal either a business or a personal goal for you um, and also that you have the the time and the motivation to be able to see it through because i think ultimately consistency is key um, so yeah, I'd say for like the early starters, um, you know, it's the, the, the one thing they want to see is that they've got people listening. There's someone listening to the podcast and how can you make that experience of getting your first listener that's like really special. Mm -hmm. So yeah, like I said about the feedback, that's really important for just, I think, hooking the podcaster in and being like, okay, wow, this is working. I can build on this. And then I think at the other end of the spectrum, you have the larger podcasters who are already monetizing through different channels. They have, you know, a million downloads a week. They have a team of producers working on the podcast. So I'd say that, yeah, learning that the motivations between those podcasters are very different because if you look at the higher end, really all they're interested in is growth. They're not necessarily interested in Fountain as a monetization tool or potentially even as like a community or engagement tool. They're just thinking about growth. Whereas at the lower end, it's really it's about you know, feedback and audience interaction. So that that's definitely one thing. I'd say that podcasting more broadly, as I've as we've been building the app, I think I've just grown to realize like how much 
how much potential there is for RSS as the technology, the protocol that underpins podcasting, but how much work there is still to be done. And like I said, you know, if you think about this way, most people, I think particularly the older generation, you know, maybe they listen to podcasts, but they might just think of podcasts as, oh yeah, it's the purple app on my phone that I go onto, I listen to the podcast and, you know, that's fine, that's great. But how can we educate people that there are, you know, more compelling podcasting experiences out there that look more similar to the other experiences you have in social media, video streaming, etc. So yeah, I'd say I've just learned a little bit more about what are the fundamental issues on a technical level, but also on an educational level for how to um, overcome those roadblocks that have held podcasting back for so many years. Because if you think about it, podcasting has been around for like 20 years. Um, if you think about YouTube, that's been around for less time, but it's so much more developed, uh, as a, as a media form. Maybe it's just because it's video. Um, uh, maybe video is more compelling to people. I don't know, but yeah, podcasting, you know, is in great shape. There's also a lot of talk recently about, you know, has podcasting died post COVID, you know, cause there was obviously a massive interest in podcasting during that time. People are reporting that listener numbers are dropping off, um, that, you know, podcasting is not evolving, but I think it is. And I really like to think that we're really at the center of making that, making that change. Talking about the fact that you don't think that podcasting is dying. Do you have any data to back that up or is that your sort of general feeling about it? I think that the, the statistic that people point to the most is the number of new episodes being released or the number of active RSS feeds. So that spiked massively um, during COVID because people were creating new feeds, starting to put out content regularly. And then as things slowly got back to normal, uh, a lot of those new podcasts sort of just died off. They gave up, they stopped posting. But one thing we haven't seen dip is just regular podcast use. So like the number of people, you know, in the UK, for example, who have listened to a podcast in the last week or the last month, uh, and also the regularity at which they're listening, those numbers are going up and up. Mm, interesting. So what do you think is the future of podcasting? Um, I would say that podcasting, thinking about where it came from, uh, you know, back in, you know, when, when Steve Jobs first put podcasts into the iPod and into iTunes, it was just a way to listen to audio and download that audio to your device, listen to it offline. And if you look at what Fountain is doing now, and also the other you know, apps in this space and podcasting 2.0, the type of features and experiences that we're able to bring to life are just so far beyond what we had before. But I think also we're now seeing, uh, we've been seeing this for several years, that the definition of what a podcast is, is changing. Because actually some of the biggest podcasts in the world exist on YouTube. And if it's on YouTube, it's technically not a podcast. So Joe Rogan, for example, Andrew Huberman is another example. Um, we're seeing that definition change because it's something that you consume as a video. Those videos then get shared as clips on TikTok and Twitter. You still have the audio in the podcast apps, but then you also have podcasters doing live shows as well, uh, you know, both virtually online, but then also taking their podcast into stadiums and, you know, large event spaces. So I think that the future of podcasting is a definition of podcasting, which is maybe a little bit looser. Uh, and that ties in the other areas of, you know, uh, video, social media, payment, all of those different aspects. I certainly see that. I mean, our show is on YouTube as well. And actually, when we first started, that was the main priority. So creating that visual and creating something that you can watch rather than listen. And that was just personally, well, both mine and my husband, who was involved in the podcast, um, idea because I like to watch things as opposed to listen to them. So I never really paid that much attention to the audio part, but that has become increasingly more and more important because I think different people consume podcasts or shows or whatever you want to call them in different ways. So you've got this whole audience of people who need to have the visual. So they'll go on Spotify or YouTube. Then you have a whole load of people who will just only listen to it while they're cooking or whilst they're you know going for a walk or whatever they're not really in a position to watch it and then there is a whole other segment of people who don't listen to the full thing at all and they rely on you creating those snippets 
and those short clips, which is really interesting how you're working with the long form, but then also condensing that into something that is snackable. And I find that idea of like almost polar opposites really interesting. And, you know, what you're doing on your app with regards to creating those snippets, I think that's really interesting too. Mm. Yeah, the short form has definitely become a lot more popular. And I think that, you know, the short form clips, you know, ultimately that's how Joe Rogan got to be where he was today. Um, it's through people sharing clips on TikTok and YouTube, right? And um, yeah, it's, it's a massive uh, lever that podcasters can pull for, I think, brand awareness of their podcast. What I would say though, is that it doesn't necessarily translate to downloads, which are really the metric that most podcasters are measuring themselves by. And if you think about the way that podcasts are monetized through ads and sponsorships, your downloads are an important metric, even though they're not a very reliable metric, because it's only, it's not really telling you how engaged the audience is or how long they listened for, or you know, how much they enjoyed the content. It's just telling you if they actually played it. Um, yeah, re relying on that is not, is not great. So if you're d deploying a strategy to have short form video clips that you're sharing on TikTok, that's great. But how are you actually going to translate that into downloads? I have to say my personal experience was that there's one clip on TikTok that got just under half a million views. And that resulted in a lot of downloads, which got our podcast to number three in the Trumpable charts. And that really surprised me because up until that point, I was thinking, oh, we're spending so much time on the short form content and it's doing nothing. But actually as a result of just that one short clip, it made a massive impact. So in my experience, at least then it has worked. Yeah, that's really interesting to hear. And I, I think that they can work, right? But what you're what you're asking the the viewer to do is to see that video and then you know they're probably seeing that on twitter or tiktok or wherever they are and to leave that app open up another one go and find you and then start following and then start listening and they're going to get lost somewhere along those steps i think if you have a video that gets half a million views you obviously have a much bigger pool of users you're going to see more people downloading I think that people who are deploying a strategy whereby they're creating short clips, video clips of every podcast, hoping that that's gonna be the thing that makes or breaks them, that might not always play out in that way. So I think one thing we're really, we're really interested in is like, how can we solve this problem? Can we solve the problem of when a clip is created, actually being able to take you directly to the episode page and where you can follow? And something we haven't figured out yet, but it's something we're working on. I think again, with a short, clip creation. I mean, I'm no guru or expert on it. I'm only talking from my own experience and it's extremely time consuming. And as a creator, you're also having a job of how can I make it short and snappy, but also how do I make sure that the message is being conveyed in the right way, but also in an interesting way that is going to get people to convert, to listen to the whole thing. So that's the the mental process of trying to create them. But there is that audience that is interested in discovering new things. You can be consuming with a purpose to actually finding something that's relevant to you. And I think that's when it comes to apps, that's where they can really help the user to get what they want. And I think of all of them, I think TikTok does that really well. I think how they've got their algorithm works really, really well. Absolutely. TikTok for us is, you know, the, the best example we can think of, of it out, the algorithm working well. I think particularly when it comes to recommendations, if you look at the hashtag book talk, the amount of discovery of new novels and literature through TikTok alone yeah. is immense. And you're talking about a medium, which is printed pages here. Um, so it gives us a lot of hope that audio recommendations can work in the same way. Um, I think that podcasters, you know, as you will know yourself, maintaining a high level of quality and frequency for a podcast is a lot of work. And so creating clips of your podcast is just another thing on your to-do list, right? Um, and I think that, like I said before about that stat, you know, most podcasters who start a podcast actually fail and give up. 
you have to start out by making it manageable yeah. and you should only be doing video clips at the beginning if you know you can sustain it um, there are obviously different tools that podcasters have now to create clips there's a lot of good ai clips uh, sort of technology out there where you can just you know put the audio in or put the video in it will then tell you which bits to clip but the way that we do it is actually essentially outsourcing it to your audience and that's really interesting because the clip that you might select for your podcast or the clip that the AI might select for your podcast that you or they think is most interesting might not actually be the best clip. And, you know, it's really your listeners who are listening intently throughout the whole thing as fans from the other side of the fence. They're the ones who can tell you what the best parts are. So what we've done is create a clipping tool which removes the friction of that. So you can create a clip in seconds in Fountain, but it also you you're incentivized to do it because like i said if other people like your clips you get paid you get rewarded for it so it's kind of creating a sense of co-creation between the podcaster and the audience that didn't exist before no i really like that and i was just thinking as a creator that could be a really useful tool in itself because if your audience is clipping certain parts then you can then say okay this is resonating let me go and create a clip you know, it could be a visual clip and then let's put it on all the social media. So that could be a really useful tool that way. And with regards to other advice that you would have for podcasters, and you mentioned before about some of the, the larger podcasts are all focusing on growth. What advice could you give to podcasters to grow their podcast? Yeah, so I think that, um, you know, ultimately the the main thing is make a good podcast you know <laughs> that's the first thing you might not be making a good podcast straight away so the, the only way to make a good podcast is to be really consistent um you know focus on maybe getting you know 100 episodes out set that as your target even if the episodes suck and no one's listening just keep on making them and you will get better because ultimately you know the better the content the, the more likely it is to grow and the more consistent it is, the less chance you have of giving up. Um, the other thing I would say is experiment. Um, we've already talked about kind of clips. You know, we've talked about using different AI tools, different things at your disposal to essentially disperse your podcast and put it in different places to maximize the opportunity for new eyeballs to, to see it. Um, that's the other thing. And I think that the other is... Um, yeah, if you are able to give, get feedback on your podcast through an app like Fountain, definitely listen to the feedback um, because it's very easy to get carried away and kind of get in your own bubble and think you're making something that everyone loves. But really, if you're not listening to to what people do want, then you're never going to grow. Um, and then, yeah, I, I'd say obviously I'm biased, but I'd say definitely download Fountain and, and try that out too. I think that, you know, the, the ideology that Fountain is built on is that it's your fans that are the best people to share your content. And that is pure organic growth. You don't have to pay for it. It's something that people will hopefully do out of their best interest if you only you can communicate the how and why um, to the best of your ability. So don't underestimate the, the power of your existing listeners to help you grow. Because ultimately, if one of your listeners tells two other people and those two other people tell two other people, then you have natural kind of viral organic growth. Um, there are obviously some paid tools out there and we actually have our own within Fountain called Fountain Promotions. Uh, what this allows you to do if you claim your podcast is just basically put some advertising spend behind an episode. It will then be seen on the homepage in Fountain and anyone who listens to that episode is actually going to be earning money. So people are incentivized to give your podcast a go. And like what I said before, so many podcasts, so little time, having that financial incentive to do it makes you more likely to actually take that action mm -hmm. um, and that i think differs from a lot of the other podcast promotion sort of ad services out there i know that overcast has one built into their ad where you can buy ad space for your podcast but what they can't guarantee is that people are actually going to listen um, so that's definitely uh, something that i would suggest doing and if you look at the economics of it as well it works out very well so let's say you were to put you know 50 pounds behind or 50 dollars behind a paid promotion on fountain you're going to be paying less than two cents per listen which is incredible really and it's it's affordable for someone who's just starting up so it's a great growth hack it's certainly a much better growth hack for paid promotion than 
buying ads on Instagram or Twitter or doing paid search on Google because again you have the issue of okay I'm seeing an ad for this podcast looks interesting but I've actually got to go into my podcast app and find it and follow it and go and listen to it whereas you know we're kind of um, going straight to the source and making it easy for you just to start listening straight away. Mm. Paying people for listening is there a conflict there because if you're no longer paying them to listen what's the incentive them for them to continue? I think that um, our hope is that and I think we've seen this in with Fountain as well people might hear about the ability to earn money by listening to podcasts and have that pique their interest and inspire them to download the app. And that might, it might be the thing that they, they come for initially, but we hope that by giving them a really compelling product experience, uh, that is better than the one they had before with the podcast app they were using is the thing that keeps them staying. And I think it's also the nature of the relationship you build with the podcaster through P fountain that keeps you there as well. Um, you know, if you look at some of the most successful podcasts on Fountain, they're getting, uh, you know, upwards of a thousand supporters a month and on any given episode, maybe a hundred, 200 different supporters. And you go onto these episode pages, there's just streams and streams of like comments and replies, conversations, you know, the podcast hosts replying to things, even the guests on the podcast replying to things. That is something that's worth sticking around for. And we don't really sell Fountain on the basis of, you know, it's the podcast app where you get paid to listen. We tried that in the past. And I think that the result was you end up attracting a load of listeners who are only there to get paid. The minute you stop paying them, they're going to stop using the app. So we have to be sold um, based on the quality of experience versus, you know, the potential upside benefit of using Fountain financially. What has been the most challenging thing for you to set up the app? I think, um, to be honest, the, the most challenging thing for me personally is my own perfectionism. You know, that is the thing that gets in the way of everything. And no one tells you this when you start a company, but you quickly realize when you do that when you start out, your product sucks. You know, <laughs> your, your, your service sucks. Mm -hmm. And it's just you, maybe a co-founder, you know, with you, try, just trying to make it work. And that's something that I really battled with at the beginning, the sense of frustration of like, ah, oh, like this isn't, this isn't quite as good as it needs to be, or it's not perfect. And we've still got so much to do. And I think that over time, I've just grown much better at just, you know, not sweating the small stuff, focusing on the bigger picture, you know, holding yourself accountable to your vision and not necessarily, you know, the thing that people are looking at, like, as long as you have a strong belief in that and, you know, you're calculated about how you're going to get there you know you don't have to worry about you know perceptions uh, of people along the way you just have to keep grinding it out mm. I'm totally with you on the perfectionism part I think it's really if it's part something that's part of you it's very hard to let go of it but for especially early stages it's like you're right like nothing nothing goes right you're yeah. always constantly like failing because you don't know what it's going to take for it to work and you're constantly experimenting so yeah I totally feel that yeah and it was a big um it was, it was a big contrast as well because I was like I said before I started Fountain I was working at Nike and Nike you know even though it does have its downfalls is about as perfect as it gets when it comes to a brand you know, the story they tell, the product they have, you know, the relationship they have with their consumers, there is nothing else like it. So coming from Nike and starting Fountain, <laughs> you know, going from being one of 77,000 employees in a global company to just being me and my co-founder, you know, in a room together, just trying to figure it out was mm. definitely a big change. When you said earlier on, when you started talking about, you know, that you came from Nike, I was like, Wow, I remember as a as a headhunter, you know, working within especially within sports lifestyle space and working with either smaller businesses or startups. And it's like we don't want anybody from Nike because they cannot adjust to being working in a more entrepreneurial way because you've got all the data, you've got all the systems, you've got all of the teams, and it's really hard to adjust. So yeah, totally that going from like a very or like a super brand to then run your own business that must have been quite a shock 
definitely was and I, I think that um you know i think that actually nike is great at on like encouraging entrepreneurship within the company um they're very much city led and city focused so that you do have a lot of autonomy locally on the ground uh, and that's ultimately the work that i was doing it was building relationships with you know consumers in london um delivering amazing experiences uh you know not through the products but through uh, the other channels as well I'd, I'd say that the main thing with nike is that it's yeah it's just a big company and it's very difficult to get stuff done um because you know politics get involved budget gets involved and that was a breath of fresh air for me as a founder you know luckily we got uh, funding at an early stage so we had the financial freedom to go and pursue things and we didn't have anyone to hold us back if we thought something was a good idea we're going to do it today um, mm -hmm. it might not be perfect today but we're going to make a start on it today what's the speed of the decision making that you don't have to jump through hoops and other people to make that happen yeah exactly mm -hmm. you mentioned you have a co-founder how how did you meet yeah, so my co-founder Oscar, we we actually met at school, so we've known each other um, twenty years or so, and uh, yeah, he he was always someone I guess that I saw a lot of potential in as someone who was going to make it. Um, he's incredibly hardworking. He's incredibly passionate. His skills are and his you know, background is uh, in engineering uh, and software development which is the polar opposite to me. My skills are very much in, you know, marketing and community. And so I, I thought from a, from an early stage that maybe there was an opportunity for us to do something together in the future. And we always spoke about doing something in the future. And yeah, like I said, it was just kind of right place, right time. It was COVID. There was a lot of working from home. There was a bit more downtime. A lot of people, not just myself, reflecting on what are they doing in life? What are they going to do next? And yeah, we just sort of uh, started meeting up regularly. Just I was just helping him out on uh, a kind of a, an early prototype for an app that he was building. Uh, so he had just uh, exited a company that he'd, he'd sold and founded. Uh, that company was based in um, like voice applications. So he was basically building uh, apps for Amazon Alexa uh, and stuff like that. And yeah, he had this early prototype for uh, like I said, a, a social audio app that I was sort of just interested to help him out with. And then, yeah, I, I had no idea it would turn out to be what it has become now. But I think, yeah, you just have to, you have to just kind of go with your instincts, don't you? There is a certain element of instinct when you've made enough of the right decisions to know what feels right. So you can make that snap judgment. And then the other thing is about more of a bias that you're only seeing it from a certain perspective. Um, so I think if you've had experience in one specific area and you can rely on that gut rather than, you know, just making snap decisions. But I think when it comes to finding a founder, that's a really interesting dynamic. And I always say that when you're looking for a founder, you know, you're looking for somebody who compliments you on what you're not good at whether it's technical skill, whether it's personal qualities, but you always have to have that foundation of having the same values and the same vision. And then the third aspect that I talk about is the ability to handle conflict. So conflict resolution. So have you and your founder not seen eye to eye on certain things? Oh yeah, all the time, mm -hmm. but that's okay, you know? And, and we, you know, we, we do have heated exchanges about stuff. We do argue about things and we do have different opinions and that's natural. You know, you're never both going to have the same opinions on everything. Um, I think as long as you can just be open uh, in sharing your opinion and, you know, I suppose just working it out in a diplomatic way and accepting that, you know, I can't be right on everything. I have to be right on certain things. Same for him as well. And it's just acknowledging, okay, actually, I've heard your point of view, and I think you might be right on this one. So I, I'm going to say I'm wrong. And the next conversation, you start again, you know, you leave that behind you. The next conversation is completely different. So you don't have, um, you're not relying on previous decisions or previous conversations to like almost set this thing between you. You just have to kind of start on a blank slate, every single discussion being like, okay, who's right, who's wrong here. And we could both be right, could both be wrong. Um, I think that for me, having someone who is also like a long-term friend as a co-founder is great because we know each other very well. Um, 
we didn't have that period of getting to know each other or having to get to know each other um which so we, we were kind of on the same page from from the very beginning uh so I, i'd say that i wouldn't advise against anyone from going into business with a friend i know a lot of people do advise against that but i certainly haven't had that experience mm. i guess as with any relationship it has the potential to break it but my perspective is well you know what do you lose by not going down that route because that could be the business partner that makes your life you know it's like the, the fact that you're not willing to take that risk means that you potentially are missing out on something even greater so yeah i mean what do you want to lose not losing a friend or not losing you know that opportunity to grow something like incredibly big together mm. and you know there are lots of very successful solo founders um i just know that I don't think I could be one. Yeah. You know, I do need someone else there. And, you know, things aren't going to be great all the time. And the chances are that one of you is in a slightly better place and then the other one is suffering a bit more. And particularly at the early stage where, like I said, you know, you're grappling with this, how do I get this idea of this vision into reality and, and the product in people's hands that people are going to enjoy and that I'm going to feel good about? And you're not going to feel good about it all the time, but having someone else there does kind of buoy you up in those moments of mm. moments of need. I mean, yes, there are solo founders that are successful, but it's very hard to make that happen. And from the investor side, it's they would they are much more likely to look at companies that have teams rather than just solo founders. It's really hard to it's really hard to make it because you have you don't have that almost like board of directors or different perspectives where you can't always compensate for your own blind spots. And if you're down, there isn't another energy to kind of help lift you out of it or having to make a decision and not having somebody else to kind of bounce it off with. Even if you have mentors, even if you have some, you know, advisors, still having somebody who will push you and maybe challenge you on your own thinking is incredibly valuable. Mm. Yeah, I think like from experience, fundraising in itself is basically a full-time job. If you're going to do it successfully, yeah, you need to dedicate pretty much everything to it for three, maybe six months. And if you're doing it on your own and you have no one else running the product or the service you're delivering while you're doing it, nothing's happening. So you do need you do need teamwork and you do need delegation and just a shared understanding of like, right, I'm doing this really big, important thing for us as a company right now. I need you to manage X, Y, and Z so we can deliver on both fronts. And yeah, doing it on my own, I think I, I would have struggled to do that. Mm. What one thing people don't usually know about you? Oh, that's a good question. I think that I might come across as very confident and self-assured, but that is not the case. You know, I, at the worst of times, am, you know, a very uh, severe self-critic and, you know, my self-esteem is fairly low. And I think that this is something, particularly amongst founders, that people hide and they kind of have to conceal just in the sort of fight to survive. And... I found that I was I was fighting with that for a very long time. For me, the thing that actually I thought was a solution was drinking. You know, I used to drink um, heavily. I always enjoyed drinking. And particularly, you know, before Fountain, I was working in advertising, um, working very hard. Um, I mentioned already I'm a perfectionist, so I would work extra hard just to make sure that everything was perfect which obviously it never can be. And yeah, through those times of stress and anxiety and self-doubt, self -doubt, drink was the thing that I turned to. And for a while that worked, you know, it definitely suppressed the self-doubt I was experiencing. It made me more confident. Uh, it helps me go out and do things that were difficult. Um, but after a while, I just realized that it was no longer serving me in a positive way anymore. And, you know, you talk about leadership, but really, how can you be a leader if you're a passenger in your own life? And that's how I felt, you know, I felt like the, um, 
you know, it was it was a compulsion to drink. I didn't I didn't have a choice anymore. And for me, it got particularly bad about 18 months ago. And by that point, it had almost become daily. Um, it had certainly become earlier and earlier in the day. Um, but it was increasingly, like I said, um, you know, I, I'd lost agency at, agency over it myself. Um, it was something that I just felt like I had to do. And I, I guess I just woke up one day and I was like, this isn't working, you know. And the reality is, like, if I look back on my life, like particularly my social life, a lot of that confidence I've got, you know, when in social interactions, when making friends, building relationships, a lot of that confidence had come from drinks. So there was a lot of fear in me about, you know, will I still be the same person if I give up drinking? Um, so yeah, the only way to to find out was to to try it. So yeah, today I'm 15 months sober and it was honestly the best decision I've ever made. I've learned so much more about myself. Um, I've learned that I I can have self-belief and I can have confidence and I can um, build relationships with people without any of that stuff involved. Um, you know, it is difficult. There are testing moments, but on the whole, like, like I said, is the best thing I've ever done. And as you know, that your question was like the, the thing that people don't know about me. I am quite open about this. Um, I think it's important to be open about it because ultimately I was very closed off about it for many, many years. And to be honest, it was partially just listening to people talking on podcasts about their own experiences with mental health and addiction, alcoholism. Um, you know, podcasting is such a great medium for that because it's so intimate. People just feel like they um, can say anything, even though anyone could be listening. You know, really, it's just you in a room with another person telling your story. So those things come out. So yeah, I would I would always encourage like anyone who who thinks they might be struggling um, or thinks they might have you know an issue with alcohol just to to talk to someone about it. And I think that's the best thing that I did was just talking about it. Did anything prompt it? You said that was fifteen months ago. Was there a specific moment that you thought this is it? So that year, I I got married, and uh, it was just after launching Fountain as well. And yeah, there was just a lot going on. You know, I felt a lot of pressure, um, a build up of pressure that I hadn't felt before. And like I said, my, my drinking just escalated kind of without me realizing really, uh, when I look back, I can see how quickly it progressed, but it's funny that we, we, we have an office in WeWork in Shoreditch and famously WeWork offices have a free beer tap that they open mm -hmm. from three o'clock. And I would just find myself counting down until three o'clock. And then there'll be some days, particularly sunny day, I'd, I'd be looking out the window at 12 being like, why am I waiting until three? I'm just gonna go and have a drink in the pub when I have my lunch. Um, and then on one instance, it was a really nice sunny day. I was cycling into the office and I had a drink before I got into the office. And that was for me, a line that I never thought I'd cross. Mm -hmm. And everyone has their own uh, understanding of what an alcoholic is. I certainly had a perception of one before I, I admitted to being one. Uh, but for me, you know, drinking daily and drinking early in the morning was a sign that something's not right. So as soon as I hit that point, I was like, something's got to change here uh, because I can only see this getting worse. You know, if I look back on the last six months, I can see how worse it got already. Luckily for me, I still had all my life intact. You know, I still had a wife. Um, I still had my own business. I still had family and friends around me. I was still uh, financially stable. I, if I hadn't have got help, who knows? Like I might've lost many more of those things. I've spoken about addiction and alcoholism with other guests in the past. And one of the things that they have struggled with the most have been the social aspect of it both from the fact that it's something that you just do in your day-to-day -day life, but worse, other people, when you stop, have a very strange and very angry reaction at you stopping. Did you experience that? <laughs> it's, yeah. So personally, uh, not really. 
And the reason was, is because I was very upfront with people about the reasons I was stopping drinking. Um, and you know, it's topical, it's January. A lot of people stop drinking for January or do a hundred days or whatever. Um, and you know, when, if you tell your friend down the pub, you're doing dry January, so you're not going to have a pint. They look at you with like, you said that sense of just like confusion of like, why would you not? And it just says a lot about society really that, you know, drinking has become so socially accepted, if not encouraged. Um, but the reality is that alcohol is a drug and it's sold on every street corner to, to anyone. And that's a really dangerous place to be in for people who are susceptible to, you know, addiction. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I was just very open and honest with people why I was stopping drinking and explaining the impact that it had on me. And I think once you explain that to people, you know, they, they get it and they don't give you any grief about it. But yeah, I do, I do empathize with people who struggle to stop because of the social pressure and you know what their mates might say mm -hmm. but ultimately if your mates can't just like hear your truth and understand where you're coming from like I don't think they're really friends mm. I think it's hard for a lot of people to be honest and open about it like you are saying that actually has an adverse effect on me and I cannot handle it and it's ruling me rather than me being in control of it I think it's hard to say that very hard mm -hmm. yeah I mean I, I I never I never thought it was some was something that I would have to uh come to accept about myself but the moment that I did accept that I was an alcoholic everything got better um it's accepting defeat and it's from defeat that you're able to to rebuild I lived in denial for so many years about my alcoholism you know thinking that it was normal thinking oh well you know so and so drinks more than me or I'm not like that or I'm not doing that yet I'm not that bad but you know you just have to accept it and you know people often ask me as well like are you gonna not drink forever like you know would you maybe occasionally have one but I just know that it has to be all or nothing like moderation is just not part of my skill set when it comes to drinking um, so, it, so it has to be complete sobriety and yeah, that is difficult to maintain, but it's much easier to maintain if I have, you know, a program, if I'm honest with people. And I think also I know that by talking openly about my alcoholism, I'm also helping other suffering alcoholics who haven't come to accept their condition yet. Mm -hmm. And that's something as well that gives me hope and helps me stay sober. Mm. I... I say now, I don't feel like I ever had a problem with alcohol, but I'm pretty much not drinking anymore at all. And this happened as a result of just spending more time on health and exercising in which, and my husband's not drinking at all anymore either, exclusively because of that. That eventually you don't really like the effect that it has on you. Um, but I still struggle with talking about not drinking because of the effect that it has on other people my reason isn't that i have a problem with it but looking back on how i used to drink in my 20s even in my 30s you know what i probably did i mean it was like a crutch in many circumstances but worse it was something that you do to kind of maintain the social bonds because that's what everybody else is doing and i think untying yourself from that is 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 really is really hard but i think you're right sharing your story and talking about it so openly i really do hope that it sends a good positive example that it doesn't have to rule your life and you can be a successful entrepreneur and kind of continue on your on your journey and to do amazing things so thank you very much for being so open about it oh of course mm. so what's next for you with fountain yeah so um this year we have some really exciting stuff going on um firstly the most important thing is that we just have to continue um ensuring that fountain delivers on the fundamentals exceptionally um if you're switching you know or asking people to switch from another podcast app to start using fountain you have to make sure that everything's there. You have to make sure that everything works properly. So that's the the, the core focus. Um, the second thing is uh, I mentioned Bitcoin and, you know, the reason why we've integrated Bitcoin into the app, because it allows us to do things that, you know, uh, PayPal and credit cards can't do. 
that's all very well, but there's also so many skeptics out there who just are, um, you know, put off by the fact that Fountain has anything to do with Bitcoin and also a lot of podcasters as well. And ultimately, that's how we see our growth. It's really podcasters bringing their listeners to Fountain. So we are going to be, um, I suppose, putting Bitcoin more in the background. It will still be the thing that, you know, delivers the experience with regards to the payments and then the social discovery that comes about from the payments. However, we want to just put it in the background and in the foreground, just have your chosen currency, which I think is just going to open the, the app up to um, a much wider, more diverse group of users, both listeners and podcasters. Um, the other thing that we're really excited about as well is expanding to new mediums. So one of those mediums is audiobooks. We hope to in introduce audiobooks in the next few months, and that will work in exactly the same way as it does for podcasts. So as a as a writer, you can you know find your audiobook on Fountain. You can claim it to start receiving payments. People can also create clips of your audiobook, um, you know, put it into playlists, etc. And you know, have that interaction with your readers that you might have never had before. And I think this is uh, particularly uh, you know the issue I explained about the lack of feedback for podcasters is even worse. I think for for for, for writers uh, because you know th th there really is even more distance there uh, in terms of the relationship. So that's something we're really excited about. And one other thing we're excited about as well is music. And we do actually have music in the app right now. Um, so in the same way that podcasts are you know, hosted on an RSS feed, the podcast apps pull in the RSS feeds and get all the latest content, you can also host music on RSS feeds as well. Now, most of the music apps we use, YouTube Music, you know, Spotify, etc don't rely on RSS feeds. Um, but we've, you know, in podcasting 2.0, you can host uh, music on an RSS feed and you can pull that into the apps. And you actually have a brand new category of podcasts emerging, which are music podcasts. And you might have noticed, like, if you ever do hear music on a podcast, why is it that you only hear like 10 seconds of it? And if you do hear any longer, you think like, have they got the rights to like include that music in the podcast? And that's a massive issue. Um, what you can now do in Fountain is any music which is hosted on an RSS feed, you can openly use in your podcast and you can listen to a podcast. Imagine it being a bit more like a drive time radio show where you've got a DJ playing multiple tracks. There's maybe a bit of conversation in between. In Fountain, you can listen to those podcasts and you can actually click through directly to the tracks that are being played. And also when you're supporting the podcast, the money goes directly to the artist that's being pl played at that moment. And this, I think is something that's really cool. Um, it's just, I think one of many new things happening in this space of music and podcasting 2.0. And we think there's gonna be more in the future as well. Nick, thank you so much for coming onto the show. Really feel very privileged that you've been so open and honest about your personal experience and for sharing about fountain and i would encourage everybody to go and download it check it out and would love to be interacting with everybody there so um but thanks thanks very much <laughs> thank you nick you've been listening to anatomy of a leader podcast i'm your host maria vorostovsky if you haven't already please follow and subscribe this podcast and i'll see you in the next episode <laughs>